Welcome to another episode of Architect Tomorrow. This is another one of the core topics for the series, the sustainability, which we've covered a few times, but I'm really keen that we, we, do, we do more on that, this topic. Gael, thanks very much for joining. Thanks for inviting me. For those who haven't spotted, we did a podcast actually together. We did an episode of, of Gael's Green IO podcast recently, where we were talking about open source and sustainability. Uh, and so um, we said we'd also do one more on the architecture theme and, and, do, and do it on architect tomorrow. Gail, I always like to start with people's background. What's your sort of short story, your journey into the sort of technology space? You want the long version or the short version? Uh, let's keep it short to start with. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say I'm a rogue CTO on a mission to save planet Earth, or at least the human kind of planet Earth, which sounds terribly pretentious. So I think you want actually a, a slightly longer version. Yeah, yeah, no, lo longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm a I'm a tech generalist. Okay, so I'm not an expert in anything. Uh, I'm blessed that I understand pretty much everyone working in every field in IT, from data scientists to cloud ops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I've never had the opportunity to deep dive into one topic and become an, an expert because this is what I've been doing for almost the last twenty years. I've been mostly a manager, and the first thing you learn when you are a manager is that you cannot be an expert anymore, or you will be a terrible manager. So, <laughs> I'm I'm a good tech generalist, and I've been managing teams and product and tech teams, etc., up to a CTPO position. And three years ago, so mostly in the payment service industry, and then in the prop tech industry, like for real estate platform, and um. It was three years ago, almost three years ago. I had this opportunity in my life to reconsider what should be, I would say, the second half of my career, maybe a bit more, actually. Um, and I started to question myself. And I kind of reused a, a tool that I failed to use properly twice before, which is the Ikigai, you know, the Japanese stuff or, uh, yeah. This is the thing that kind of aligns what you can do with what you love to do with what the world needs, isn't it? Is that the Venn diagram that has those three things that overlap? Yeah, what, what, yeah. What, and what, you, what you're good at, what you yeah. love to do, what the yeah. world needs, and is there some money for you to make? Otherwise, it's, right. it's you know, it's a volunteering activity. Yeah. It cannot be a job. Yeah. So this kind of four angles. And it took me literally a couple of days, no more, to realize that, yeah, well, I'm going to stay in the IT field because this is where I'm good at or at least not that bad and environment is really something that buzzes me and it is the only question one well, question mark was can i make some money of it but i had some money um some savings so i decided to go uh full speed into the uh, tech sustainability question and my angle was if you google sustainability in tech or digital technology uh you will get I don't know, half a billion answer on how tech will save the world. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, but that was pretty hard to discover how much harmful or what we should change as tech people uh, to actually save the world. Oh, once again, I'm going to stop. I mean, that that's kind of a nice phrase, but that's a completely wrong phrase. Save humankind habitability of this world. Uh, um, mm -hmm. the, the word will do fine with or without us and even you know planets etc nature will survive in, in some way but the question is if us human we are we will be still there in in, a, in in two or three centuries um and and the more i started to investigate this tech sustainability thing the more i, I literally wanted to yell at me six months later earlier because it was like oh my God, I can't believe that you were so naive. That it was not just about writing to AWS to have them green energy, which is something that I, a word that I don't use, obviously. Uh, you had like hundreds of millions in budget and what you did was, oh my God, not what you should have done. But I didn't know that. So this is why I say, okay, but actually I've got an angle because all my former colleagues, all my former peers, uh, they are exactly in the same situation that I was before. So... Yeah, let, let's do something pragmatic. Let's do something humble uh, and just go back to them and say, you know, I, I was doing very average things when it comes to sustainability before. Um, this is what I've learned so far, and I'm still learning every day. If I can share it with you, that's all good. And how to share it? Um, I'm terrible in video editing. Uh, I'm terrible at writing because it takes me like, three months to write a page because I want always 
it to be perfect, etc. You know, I'm not an English native speaker, so I've got this kind of uh, imposter uh, uh, syndrome. And podcast was was I think a good solution. It was right. um, you know, a good way to start connecting people. And eventually, the angle was what I really enjoy is connecting people. So for you know your listeners uh, old enough, uh, I'm kind of the Nokia guy, huh? connecting people. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, very good. A boomer joke. <laughs> no. Nice tech guy. Not a boomer, there. not a boomer, but hey. Uh yeah. So for everyone under 30, Nokia used to be pretty famous in the tech uh, <laughs> industry. <laughs> and the angle was connecting what is doing in different countries, because I didn't want to focus on one country rather than another. And also across different line of works. Um, I've always enjoyed working with CFO, CPO, CTO, uh, you know. Uh, cloud ops, uh, design, UX, etc. So I wanted everyone to have an opportunity to share and not being too narrow in my approach. And this is why I launched Green IO and then the podcast. Mine has its success, I would say, has its success. Um, yeah, and it becomes uh, also conferences and and now a newsletter since yesterday. Poo-poo. <laughs> and um, you've highlighted a couple of things there that. that... I think are really important so one is this sort of realization moment that a lot of people have going through this journey and I, and I think it's unfair to beat for anyone to beat themselves up in tech about their past life because and here's the thing there is so much marketing that makes it look like tech is the savior of the planet and it has yeah, zero right. impact right uh, and what I'll probably do in the show notes is, is link to a, a nice three minute video well it's not nice really because it's exposing the, the realities of, of, of tech the the um you may have spotted I'm part of the Green um, sorry, Government Digital Sustainability Alliance. And they put together this amazing three-minute video, which I'll, which I'll put in the links. But it basically just brings to life the, the realities of, of tech's impact um, across not just energy consumption that you touched on, but, yeah, but also resource usage and water usage and so on and so forth. And I think the reality is most technologists don't, don't know the harm that the systems are creating. It's, it's a bit like you live in this dream world, and one day you get woken up out of that dream world. And so to sort of beat yourself up about the fact you're in the dream, well, you, that, that's just the reality that you're in. And the, the key, I think, is to sort of continue pushing forward, like you say, pragmatically. So I guess talking about your podcast, is there an episode that if this topic is new to them, is there an episode you recommend that helps sort of introduce this topic, kind of helps someone who is relatively new to this? Is it one of your earlier episodes that might be helpful for that sort of person? Well, the truth is I had a slightly different approach um we are now maintaining so the, the article has been live for a few days and i used to, to publish it before on linkedin but i stopped it so i want to own my own platform um a catalog of episodes because what i've realized is if you're new to the field and you're in design well you want to hear what someone like tim frick has to say yep. or uh, Anne Fogri, for instance, or more recently, uh, a great episode I've done, Thorsten Jonas and Sylvie Domal about systemic design. So, you know, and I think everyone should start where he or she is comfortable with. If you're right. in cloud, obviously yep. you want to listen to the episode with Chris Adams and, um, and, and, and other episodes I've done. The kind of episode that I could advise people to listen to take a big step back exactly bouncing back of what you say that we don't really realize the harm we do and we don't realize so many things and we don't realize that we're spicy and we should start thinking as you know a spicy trying to survive on a very limited um uh, ecosystem um is the episode i i had end of last year with maxime blondeau which was anthropology and technology. And this is Ooh. really taking a big step back, but okay. it, it really questions the core of what is never questioned in our industry is how much useful we are, uh, in what current state of technology are we, and what is technology, and all of this stuff that are buried down under a big, big layer, multiple layers of marketing. Mm -hmm. And that... I love Maxime Blondeau's work. It's not maybe the most accessible episode, but if someone wants really to think, okay, so, you know, basically with sapiens, it was only 10,000 years ago that we started to <clears throat> grow our food. Uh, and it has been for 600, 
pardon to the the Chinese civilization who has been doing this for almost one thousand years. But let let's uh, let's talk about the Western world. Um, Four hundred years, you know, that we masterize how to print things at scale so that knowledge starts to be you know accessible. And it has been like two hundred years that we've discovered fossil fuel, and in less than fifty years, then we've discovered IT. And suddenly, when you you've got this kind of mind tool, you know, not, I would say no, mind tool is not the right way. But if you're equipped with this kind of reflex thinking, all this big marketing, like we've always done like this, humanity will prevail. You're like, why? What? I mean, 200 years is nothing in terms mm. of a species. So we've always found the best technical solution. Yes, since 200 years, which is pretty much 250 years, which is pretty much nothing. And and suddenly, you know, it kind of starts to fall apart and you start seeing, seeing the big picture, which is tech has brought so many positive things in the world, but it has also created us a bit like wizard. And I'm not a very religious person. I, I, I'm a spiritual person. I think everyone should um, live his or her way in, in a spiritual way. And for many people, it means also be getting connected with a religion, which is perfectly fine. But religion as a tool of power is something that really frightens me mm. and to be honest today in the western world especially in europe uh, there is only one religion which is a tech religion uh, we will save the world <laughs> but that yeah. goes pretty far away from architecture so at some point no, you no. might want us to, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> to no, discuss cool. a bit more it's, it's, it's cool yeah we will, we, will, we will get there but i think that is an important so i mean architects have to respond to the the realities of of the political and social sort of landscape that their organization or their enterprise mm -hmm. sits in right so i think it's it you can't ignore the the the, the tide of, of current and, and you're right this sort of techno optimist manifesto that that came out is is in danger it sort of exemplifies the 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 one extreme end i think of like just thinking that technology will be a say always be a savior like every problem okay well there'll be a solution because there always mm -hmm. has been to your point and so i think that's a really interesting uh, kind of aspect for architects to sort of go into this thinking about like how can we pragmatic be pragmatic and actually say controversial things at times as an architect like does this process need to be digital or actually is the is this the manual way uh the answer or or you know it, it's a trade-off uh, and actually i was been you know, I, I mean i have very interesting conversations with with some clients like we're not planning for plan b enough like what happens if we have a sustained power loss like in the near future the grid isn't going to be mm. as, as stable perhaps because of more reliance on renewables less fossil fuel generation we may we may be in a situation where we have to accept that 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 that, that power might fluctuate a bit more than it does at the moment what happens in, in a scenario where we have to fall back to the manual option what if we've made everything digital it's just not possible no one knows how to pick up the pen anymore no one knows how to kind of do, do the old-fashioned way so uh I may, but maybe this is just sort of getting to a certain age uh you know they, they, I, I did read something the other day that said any technology that's invented before you're 35 like you kind of like just adopt it right you think yeah. it's cool and then when you get older you just start to become more cynical of things i don't know maybe maybe that's just happening to me because i'm getting into that early 40s sort of stage of life but um no i think it's important for architects to question i think that's the value of a good architect is that you don't you don't just accept what the vendor uh says yeah. and that's that's because that's essentially <clears throat> what we're dealing with isn't it it's lots and lots of marketing messages from vendors saying pick pick my platform because it's more sustainable that's what really frustrates me at the moment is so much greenwash like yeah just just pick this because it's powered by renewable energy and it's like well, that's one third of the sustainability challenge you know <laughs> <laughs> like green energy does not equal sustainability oh. so you know it's, anyway, so i think the first thing for architects to be aware of is yeah the kind of the psychology the the landscape in which we're dealing with here and the and the kind of marketing messages that that we've all been bombarded with such that they can then take a step back and go right what what are the decisions that I need to take or help my organization take uh, and go on the journey? I fully agree with what you said. And the image I'd like to share, just to, to make myself clear about what I've said before, is we are navigating a very troubled sea together. And okay. my position is not do not navigate the sea because that's not possible. It's learn the tides, learn the winds, learn where the waves come from, and you know learn how to navigate it. So when I say we are... You know, we are, and I, and I talked about the big waves of innovation. Actually, it's not to say, hey, and by the way, we should pose everything because that's not possible. No. And, and a no. pragmatic architect will no. actually know the big waves, but also the small currents and, and, and where the different winds come from. There is the greenwashing winds, but there is also uh, other winds. Um, 
that that we should pay attention to and this is really about equip I'm, I'm a bit obsessed by tooling uh, and not necessarily technical tooling but how we tool up people so that they yeah. can make the most educated decision having the biggest picture possible the most systemic view possible there's also this 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 um spectrum i think of of, of people from techno optimist all the way to degrowth there's yeah. there's, extre there's extremes at both at both ends there's like people that say we should just yeah, we should we should there's there's technology um sufficiency and there's you know degrowth and there's that one extreme end of the argument and then there are people that are on the other extreme we've already touched on and then i think i like to say in the sort of pragmatist sort of let's find a let's find a pragmatic path to kind of progress because if you're not inside the tent you you you, you don't have a you don't have a say and i think there are some people who are on the very extreme end saying like tech is terrible tech is terrible and it's like but if you're not in the room having the conversations about influencing how tech gets better. Yes, you're highlighting, but you're being quite alarmist and, and doomerist and people will just switch off and go, everything's doomed anyway. So I might as well just carry on with my extractive, exploitative business model. And that's not, I, I don't think that's the answer, right? Anyway, we are getting very philosophical and uh, yeah, we, should, yeah. we should move on. That, 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 you know, that, that the thing with the French, they, they, they like words and in philosophy, <laughs> but let's be pragmatic. Let's be English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's 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 so how many yes yeah, so how many episodes have you done now on green green io uh 35 okay and so i was originally going to ask you to pick it but you, you can't you can't you can try and pick a favorite if you like but that's probably like trying to <laughs> name your favorite child but i mean i would like I, I would love you to sort of signpost some of the the kind of highlights i suppose uh, of the of the podcast for, for yeah. folks what you know what, what the kind of what the kind I'm of key not, i'm not gonna say you, yeah, yeah no i'm not gonna say about that <laughs> <laughs> that this is my favorite one because I, I will have you know i had like i think i think it had something like 60 guests uh, on the show so if i pick just one i'm going to be in dire straits with the, all the others <laughs> um and, and and i stay connected to quite a lot of my guests so <laughs> but um yeah, there are a few episodes so i already talked about maxime blondeau's yep. work um i think i was uh impressed and both impressed, enthusiastic, and depressed after the episode with Tim Freak. Because, okay. um, I mean, Tim is a wizard. I mean, he has been in the game way, 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 way before I was aware that there were any green IT tech sustainability issue. That, that was, I mean, that was, I was completely not aware of it. He was already writing the first ever O'Reilly book on sustainability in IT, obviously very knowledgeable. And I was like, Oh, we're so blessed to have this kind of sorry, Tim, to put it that way, like big ancestor. So of course it's gonna kill me now if he hears this. But <laughs> a bit like Chris Adams or Frédéric Bordage, for instance, in France, and, and, and um, all the few that I should name, but I'm not gonna do an entire list. And um so I was like, oh, you know, we've been thinking longer than I thought about the issue and about sustainable design, especially. So that's reassuring. But on the other end, it's like that their life has been so hard, so miserable. I mean, professionally speaking, trying to push um, for, for these questions. And they were like against very strong wind. So, yeah, I'm a, I was like, it took so many years for a very straight to the point and, and, and wise message to get through. So, but still, it was a very, it was great. And it was great to have this kind of... Um, perspective like five ten years perspective of what has been already done in green it and, and you know it, it's more and it really convinced me that it's a question of momentum rather than knowledge because knowledge was already there 10 years ago actually you know the i mean the ipcc I mean, the first climate change report uh they were here 30 years ago and 30 years ago no one would truly care and now every everybody not, not everybody a lot of people talks about it so this episode i came with the conclusion that yeah momentum is more precious than knowledge and then there is this episode also with uh, Elin Oge and Eloise Non on data data AI etc which is full of examples that I still use today and Eloise Non so Elin Oge is one of the most famous keynote speakers on AI etc and with very strong orientation toward pragmatism like stop pretending that we're going to revolution everything because you know, 30, or not, not 30, like two third of a uh, board members, they still don't get it, you know. So 
go straight to the point, try to find some business models, be very mindful of what it will cost, including to planet Earth, but um, be pragmatic. But Eloise Norn, she was referring to her very hands-on experience as um, SNCF, which is the, the main French railway operator, uh, as a head of the data science team, basically. So pretty big data factory. And she gave all these counterexamples, like, you know, and she described her job, like people were entering my office asking for a machine learning uh, algorithm, and they will leave my office with a rule of three, because, <laughs> because most of the time, because most of the time that was way enough uh, to answer their questions and um and so i, I really think we're in a similar position point. with gen ai now right right i mean like people, everyone wants gen ai because it's the hype yeah. thing but it, it's it's classic isn't it I, I, I remember it with blockchain as well uh in in sort of 2017 2018 times i would sit people down and go what is the problem does it really need you, you just want to put blockchain on this don't you it, does it really need it is it really a, a challenge with you know lack of trust and multiple parties and all this sort of stuff. So, it, uh, yeah, I think this is the trouble, isn't it? We, we The industry we're in loves to latch on to a, a, a solution, um, you know, whereas we should be we should be refining the problem a little bit before we, we, we jump straight to a solution, right? I agree. So. And, uh, yeah, it's marketing. As you say, it was spot on in your introduction. There is a big issue with uh, over-marketing uh, in, in the tech field. And if you ask me to take a final one, um, um, I, I, it wasn't one of the episodes that was very technical and not that many people listened to it, but the one with um, uh, Stanislava and uh, Benoit um, about data centers uh, was very interesting because she coined the, the expression PUE fatigue. Oh, <laughs> and nice. I was like, uh, and, you know, she's an expert in life cycle analysis, et cetera. And every time she meets someone running a data center or buying some, you know, power, uh, computing power, et cetera, like PUE, PUE, PUE. And I was, oh, my God, there is so much on PUE. And, and this is not like, and I, and I get it, you know, it's like people like it was um, the passion of a fresh uh, convert. But, uh, yeah, I, I really love the way she, she nailed it. So on your point about, people trying really hard to kind of make this you know to get the awareness out there i feel like it and maybe this is um biased by my own sort of perspective on it but it does feel like it started to move from fringe to mainstream right the topic of trying to make technology more sustainable it feels like there's for a long you're right for a long time there have been many voices in the space and in fact i was involved in a green it conference back in 2008 mm -hmm. um so there have been sort of vendors and, and people talking about this topic for some time but i think the the, the narrative seems to be shifting from IT is like the, the way to make your business green because it reduced the amount of paper, reduced the amount of commuting. It's now shifting to, yes, technology can be an enabler to reduce the impact of a business, but don't forget about the impact of technology itself, particularly in an era. I, I think the thing that's really caught people's imagination is not just the power of Gen AI to talk about Gen AI, because of course every podcast right now has to talk about Gen AI multiple times. Um, it's not Gen just AI, the... Gen AI, Gen AI, Gen AI. <laughs> Are we good? <laughs> can we move on? <laughs> I can in a second. I think the thing that has I'm pleased is also capturing the um, media's interest is the impact of this because they've gone right. All this all, all, all this explosion of of applications of AI technology. It's very power hungry. You know, lots of water usage for cooling. GPUs are a very sophisticated um, product to to manufacture, and you know there's there's the, there's the potential rapid cycles of of, you know, of, of, of new um, new hardware that's potentially going to create lots of e-waste. It At least it does feel like it's finally capturing the mainstream. And it's exciting to see uh, documentaries like Clouded 2. I wish it was on Netflix, like Social Dilemma was. But, you know, I, I, and I'm kind of having actually sidebar conversations at the moment with, with someone about can we create a mass market sort of consumer focused film so that people can actually understand the impact of their technology usage because I think so many people are just wandering around completely clueless as to the impact. Let's move on to like talking about what we think technology and strategists really need to know when it comes to sustainable software. What's what's the sort of if you could like you know do the matrix mind upload thing on every architect around the world, what would be the sort of key you know what one one to two kind of key things you wish every architect when they're embarking on a technology project would would like consider and think about when it comes to sustainability. I would say uh, three plus one. Um, there are three things that are kind of specific to architect and one which is 
specific to anyone involved in an IT project. Yep. Um, I would say the first one, obviously, is data. Uh, so make sure that the way you collect data, the way you um, store it, uh, you know, and I'm not going to go all the data funnel here, but yep. my point is we collect way too much data. Uh, I think Jerry McGovern has made a, he's a battle horse of a, of, of this topic. Uh, we don't use 90% of the data we, we, we collect, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's pretty crazy, that stat, isn't it? I mean, like it's somewhere between 60 and 90%, depending on what stat yeah, you look that, at. That's, never, that's data kind never of, gets used. Yeah, that's Jerry McGovern's uh, number. Uh, to be fair, um, I had this discussion with this professor in Cambridge or Manchester. I don't remember. I'm terrible with names. Um, uh, but I, I will I will drop you the the article. They're the one writing the the article on dark data. Um, and, and you know I contacted him because the number were pretty different. It's really a question of whether you measure uh, raw data or already clean data. You know. So, yeah. but my point as an architect, um, you'll come under a lot of pressure to store, collect, store. You know th this approach like grab as much data as you can. And we'll see what how to figure. Mm. how to use it before let's say that we post technological progress for you know for a few for two decades less than two decades um and that uh, we keep the current data growth uh, rate then every year starting 2052 i love the fact that he really you know but he found the right date you know and it was like in 20 52 we will have to mine the entire mount everest every year just to build the servers that will be able to store this amount of data. Wow. And I love the idea. And of course, he's very honest, transparent. This is like to, you know, to have an image sticking in our mind, because obviously you can say, hey, but we're going to have DNA storage, whatever, et cetera. But then comes the rebound effect. And I know that you want to talk about it later. Mm. Um, but, you know, eventually the data grows today is un unsustainable. Whether, whether you can invent pretty much everything you want, even storing on DNA or whatever, uh, at some point it has to stop. And so as I think rule number one for an architect would be be mindful of the data you collect and be mindful to partner very strongly with uh, the data governance team or the data steward to make sure that these data will be deleted as soon as we don't need it. And, and, and most of the time we don't need it in a very short amount of time, so we compress glacier and then and then delay. So I think that that kind of rule number one, and I would say rule, rule number two <clears throat> is, um, you know, in this three U question that it, it's a good way to start when you want to design things sustainably with, is my product useful, usable, and used? I think architect, they've got a very important rule with the third one used. Uh, when we build something, let's make sure that we can decommission it like snapping mm. a finger which is not the case i mean you have as an architect a responsibility to what thinking about you know things could go wrong and actually most of the time especially if you're in an agile team etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, you want to test learn fast blah 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 all the mantra okay so it means that someone has to take care of decommissioning things um and if it's not built to be decommissioned at some point well that, that could be a, a big issue um, so I would say, yes, data, uh, be able to decommission. <clears throat> and then um, if this mojo maintenance is beautiful, man, every time we have to refactor for the sake of jumping to the next technology, and exactly as you said with Gen AI, oh, let's refactor a platform to uh, be able to connect with this Gen AI stuff. Well, well, hold on, hold on a second. I mean, we've invested time, energy, so we've invested carbon in this platform. You know, this website may, may, may be written in CMS, but the CMS might be uh, WordPress, you know, and this is not the sexiest CMS on earth, but like Hannah Smith uh, said in my, my, my podcast uh, a year ago, uh, yeah, but it's, it's a very sustainable technology. You know, it has been there, it's still there. You should really do the mass of if I refactor, if I use half of my 100 people for six months to refactor to gain 10% of energy savings, uh, not sure it was the investment. So, yeah, be very my be very positive about uh, maintenance. Um, 
being more and more in the industry of caring and being more and more aware of the hype things that you've described, the Gen AI and then before it was blockchain and who mm. remember the metaverse, you know, and don't <laughs> get me wrong. Every time these technologies are useful for a few things like metaverse, when, when it was invented, it was like, but actually I've already seen it. I've seen it as, and I'm sorry, it, it's not, it doesn't fit super well with the news, but I was doing this course on gaming, you know, serious gaming and how to build theories game, etc. And they had this model on how they train um, pilots, boat pilots in the Rotterdam Harbour. So I think it's number one or number two in Europe. Uh, so like one of the biggest ever uh, harbour built by mankind. And obviously, if you go if you do anything wrong with a super tanker there will be no second chance so you yeah. before becoming a pilot uh, even a, you know a co-pilot you need to be super well trained so how do you do that and they were already they had already built this fully immersive uh cabin with all of their situations a bit like airplane pilot you know and, and it was clearly a metaverse you know and they had this <laughs> yeah i totally agree the sort of simulation yeah. and training use case is is, is, is a winner and and, but and that think, was one yeah. of the only one. That's my right. point. Right, yeah. right. I mean, yeah, and and who knows where where kind of gaming and and the latest generation of of kids that are immersed in in that environment. A bit like I think you know we we, we grew up with the sort of internet kind of becoming when we were coming of age, and I suppose then smartphones have then driven people to sort of expect a smartphone experience. I do wonder whether the metaverse is it's just a little. It was a little bit ahead of its time. It probably will come back once. Once things are more mature, but you're right. It hopefully applied to the right things in 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 the right That's way. That's the question. Yeah. yeah. And, and, then the, and then the last and then the last one for everyone. You said there was three plus one. Ah, uh, the plus one is the mindset question. Be part okay. of the solution of the problem. Uh, every time someone comes back to you and say, "What will be the environmental cost?" or um, can we be a bit more energy saving? It's a question of not laughing at them, but say, hey, that's a very good question. But if it's not top of all this at the moment, we've got this IPO, we've got, we're yeah. under market pressure, et cetera, is yeah. be part of the solution, be part of the discussion. And there is no black in, I mean, we had this discussion before the recording, like is a CQ, um, well, even like a, a good old plain uh, server, <laughs> client server architecture, you know, it can, come with pro and con when it comes to sustainability i mean do you want to have 100 or 200 api call uh or or calls from your your brother for instance or do you want to run things uh on, on your client's uh, desktop but on the other end it is getting too heavy uh they might over consume electricity mm -hmm. and they might not be super low carbon electricity but the, the provider might not be uh, very low carbon so you know it's a trade you need metrics and that's for sure that we cannot say okay client server architecture or cqrs architecture or whatever architecture is is right or wrong it's more a question of asking ourselves the right question when it comes to you know data the ability to decommission the ability to maintain uh and of course being part of the a solution which is having the right mindset i would say I, I, I love those points and there's a few things that have caused me to reflect off the back of that so one is i feel like we've become rather short-termist um agile I don't, I don't want to bash agile um but but i perhaps i will for a moment i think i think the, the the trouble with it is is it's it's been applied somewhat dogmatically to the extent that we've lost sight of the fact that technology has a, a often has a long-term yeah, implication to, to your point about you know we, we we create stuff we don't delete it that's the, you know, that's the, we're not great at that across across the board whether we're talking about data whether we're talking about applications you know all kinds of stuff right and so thinking about decommissioning up front sounds a bit controversial it's almost taboo i think isn't it and in a project to go oh we need to think about how this project will get unwound at some point but like, i don't think i've ever been in a, a very many project meetings where mm that has come up because it's almost like well no no no, that's that's like the elephant in the room that this system at some point will become legacy or should be switched off that it, it's, it's never even considered it well in most cases it's not considered and therefore the, the thought about all this data we're generating how long it should be retained when it should be deleted it's just not exciting stuff that that people really want to talk about but it's important and unfortunately I, I feel like the architect needs to start to become the guardian of the longer term 
uh, and and be that kind of counterbalance against the short termist thinking that I see too much. Going back to your agile uh, example, I think it's a great one for for two things. The first one, um, architects they can do judo, you know, martial arts with this, and um, or pick pick the other one if another one if you want. But um, if people are pushing for agile mindset, then decommissioning is part of the agile mindset because it's you know launch fast, learn fast, and we're not going to succeed every time. So if we don't take time to do proper research, or if we've done just enough research to do a POC, then an MVP, then, 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 of course, the question of if everything goes wrong, let's make sure that, you know, I can decommission so that I can free resources for you to invest and reinvest in an, another project, etc. So you can really use the strengths of your opponent against him or her by by doing this agile judo thing, which is actually the, the real spirit of agile. And that will go to my point number two, because you're absolutely right about We've got a terrible misconception of agile and i've been blessed and when i was doing my um you know scrum master course whatever yeah. etc i wanted like to investigate a bit more <laughs> about what was really this this methodology which is a very powerful one i had the opportunity at the same time to read a book from michel Serre, which is a french um, philosopher sociologist etc and he one of the first one uh, coining very clearly the difference with, between complexity and complication how so complexity eh, and I'm, I'm i hope i translate it well in english but and the example he takes is a very good one um building an aircraft carrier you know is not complex at all it's complicated but it's not complex it's not complex because we know exactly what we want to build right there is drawing there is there are plans and actually there are plans to the micron and, and everything is planned ahead for five mm -hmm. years it's terribly complicated but it's not complex and launching a gaming apps that will involve i don't know snakes monkeys and elephants but in a i don't know in pakistan for instance for whatever reason uh if you're a western firm and that you have no clue about the pakistanese market and maybe there are in, in the picking of one of their three animals, something terrible, whatever. Uh, but, you know, business decided that you should invest time and energy in Pakistan. And why not, after all? But this is not that rocket science to build an app, you know, a gaming app today, a very simple one. It's what what people are trained with in, 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 um, in computer uh, science school. But it's terribly complex because you have no idea how the market will react. You have no mar no idea of actually what they want or what they don't want. So this is where you need a giant methodology, but you don't build an aircraft carrier with a giant methodology. Mm. And I think once again, coming back to your point of marketing, we decided, oh, we, 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 we found that giant methodology and they were great. And, you know, everything, it was the, the, the last hammer and everything started to become a nails. Uh, and, this is basically where the issue is. Um, and this is what has caused also so much trouble when it comes to sustainability, because the long-term thinking, you don't use agile methodology for long-term thinking, but that's okay, because this is this is stuff that are supposed to be done in discovery mode or until you know enough of your market, your products, your users, whatever. And at some point, you still use agile methodology, but you start reinvesting external constraints. And one of them is the um, fact that the planet Earth is habitable by human. But, but, but I think you're right. I think agile, it's like all these things, agile done well, I'm sure does, does consider longer term impact. But unfortunately, it's a bit like the, the conversation we were having earlier. It's it becomes a fad. Like, yeah, you know, every, every project now needs to be agile. Well, does it? You know, every every project needs to be on the cloud. Does it? Is another Don't question. Think, I, yeah. I, you know, I, we need a bit more of the it depends architecture style mindset rather than the it, 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 this is the de facto. Everything must follow best practice, which is to put things on the cloud or to mm. use an agile methodology. No, maybe maybe you know, or, or Scrum. So maybe, maybe it's Kanban, but actually maybe taboo as it might be maybe it is a waterfall project you know yeah. um and, and we should we should be okay with that rather than going oh no no we can't do waterfall anymore because that's so 1990 well it, it has its place but you're absolutely right you know you mentioned cloud too so there is one person that i admire a lot who's part of this uh, this project which is mark butcher and he, he wrote like a small like I think half a page article but it was mind-blowing and this is exactly the kind of question architects should ask themselves it was about cloud hosting 
And the narrative was, you have a very old fashioned, like 20s uh, data centers uh, who has a PUE of two, okay, in Scotland. And you have this, let's say, hyperscaler, three letters, so <laughs> coming to you and say, the cloud is so efficient. The cloud, I mean, my PUE is almost one, it's one point, you know, one, mm -hmm. whatever, et cetera. And move, 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 come come to my realm, uh, you will save the planet, etc. It happened that the data center facility is based in Ireland. So the problem now is that between North Scotland and Ireland, you've got a factor six on average with the um, carbon intensity of the grid. So if you do very basic mass by moving your workload from yeah. your very old fashioned data center based in North uh, Scotland, where the electricity grid is one of the lowest carbon ever uh, mm -hmm. in the world mm -hmm. to Ireland, which is neighbor country, you will actually not divide by two, but multiply by three, your carbon emission. And this is the kind of complex thinking, or at least, you know, step back thinking that a good architect should always have. Yeah. And there is no black and white. It's a word of uh, multiple criteria to take into consideration, trying to avoid to do to take the wrong decision and to, I would say, not have too many pollution transfer also. But that's a different story. Yeah, no, no, you're, that that's such a good example. I met Mark for the first time last week. Actually, uh, we've been talking for a while, but hadn't met in person. So it's great to meet him. But no, I totally agree with the whole. Yeah, question the cloud migration thing. I mean, for some people, sure, they've got an old mm. data center that's in a carbon intense region. The hardware's been sweated, and therefore, it is it's a good time. But 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 if but yeah, if you've got a data center that's actually got a fair amount of life left, this kind of comes to the other part I, I touched on earlier. The that the the energy consumption is one third, and this touches on the sort of technology carbon standard that we've we've put out recently, right? And that we've spoken to you about before. Um, but that talks about upstream operational and downstream. And of course, there's other impacts as well, like moving that workload to Ireland, there's all of a sudden a whole load more networking transfer that's going on. Agreed. So there's a whole bunch of other, other things that just, it'd be all right. It's frustrating that the simplistic message of just be cloud first because everyone is, uh, and it's also greener, is, is, is frustrating. And in some cases, sure, it is, but it, but it, it, it depends. It, it might, it might it, it not, depends. it depends. Yeah. Cool. Look, there's a couple of things I wanted to I wanted to sort of touch on before we finish because I think they're important messages for for architects as well before we before we wrap up. One one thing is like efficiency. Like I think one of the big realizations for me in this in this world was that like focusing too much on efficiency is a bad thing because this thing's called because this thing uh, called Jevons paradox. Could you maybe unpack that a little bit? Well, yeah. Um, in a very pragmatic way or very simple way to say is that you save the world today and you're actually making it worse tomorrow and unwillingly. Um, why? Because, and this is, you know, Jevons was an engineer uh, and he studied carbon, the, the coal, sorry, coal consumption in London in the 90s. Uh, and he coined something called the rebound effect. And the idea was um, when the London city started to uh, build uh, large mutualized uh, heating facilities uh, to, you know, switch to replace uh, the individual uh, coal heater that that were actually creating a lot of pollution and and, and fires, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the consensus was that it will also save a lot of energy, a lot of coal to the London city because you know there's factories will be 10 times more efficient than uh, the, the individual heating uh, solution. And the result was a very significant increase in coal consumption by the London city. And the reason was very simple. Uh, heating become, uh, became sorry, affordable. Uh, so what people didn't really realize that with the previous way of uh, heating your, your flat, actually you would not heat your entire flat but you know the place where you live and that was pretty expensive so people would be uh, super cautious about not overheating etc and it happens exactly as it is today we had um I, I found a study for instance in germany which is a pretty advanced uh you know country when it comes to um, 
success sustainably mindset, I would say, that you've got the rebound effect when you isolate your room, your house, sorry, and that, uh, you know, if you isolate your house and you go for 19 degree on average, you will save a lot of money, but actually people will actually go up to 21st and that will not cause, you know, cost them too much money compared to before. So, hey, you know, I'd rather not save money, but keep my expenditure at the same level and enjoy right. uh, and enjoy a, a more cozy room. And why this this matters? Because this is exactly what happens all the time in our, in our field. Yes, we optimize energy consumption for data centers. We optimize computing. I mean, just remember how it was in the old day when you wanted to have a servers. Okay, it, it was. I, I remember writing emails, you know, with the document attached, justifying why I wanted this web server and waiting two weeks to get my server. And now it's just two lines of code, <laughs> and boom, yeah. you've got your servers. But with this. And, and it's cheaper and it's kind of more efficient, you know, no, no question about it because of the mutualization, et cetera. But then you've got what Oli Cummins, uh, uh, Cummins uh, says, like the cloud zombies, we become, some of us become lazy, not really paying attention to the instances, et cetera. Plus, hey, you know, the, the startup boom is also um, an enabling, an IT enabling boom. Uh, you, you can start it a startup with almost no cost in IT and then you will scale. So that created a massive um, potential for new consumption of IT uh, solution. It is exactly what yeah. happened. We divided by, if I remember well, I think we divided by three, yeah, uh, the energy cost of a unit of compute since 2015. So not even 10 years. Okay. And yet, overall, the energy consumption of data centers went plus 35%, and these numbers were 2022. So it was before the, the big boom in AI from the internet. So this is, this is why when you, uh, as an IT folk, uh, when you want to uh, increase efficiency, that's great. But then you have to ask the art question, or at least to put it on the table, if you're not a decision maker, what, what will you do with the savings? Mm. because if it's to buy more server more compute more it's the same you know it's if yeah. we divide by three how the, the that if we increase by a uh, factor three the efficiency of a airplane is it to actually reduce greenhouse gas emission of the airplane industry by three or to allow three times more people to travel the world that's really the question and don't get me wrong here uh, as an IT person, you're not the final decision maker. So your duty is to ask the hard question and sometimes to say, maybe we shouldn't optimize at all because the rebound effect will be so bad that we shouldn't do anything. Uh, but you're not the decision maker. Business people are the decision maker. And most of the time, society is a decision maker. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's an interesting one. I think it's worth pointing. I wanted to talk about it because... I think some people think efficiency is the answer. It's like, unfortunately, there's there's a there's a knock on impact to making things more efficient that people tend to consume it more. But um, cool. Let's 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 um, move on. Final 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 uh, area to talk to you about before I, I give you opportunity to talk about the conferences you touched on earlier is the future. So, architect tomorrow is often we're looking forward. We're, we're looking at like where 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 things are going. Do you? Do you think we can make progress on on sustainability, or do, or do you just think this is too hard, too complex? To, as you were saying earlier, do, do you see a positive, bright future, or are you somewhat pessimistic about about about, about things? Oh my God, I'm going to say that all the time. I think it depends the day. <laughs> I'm similar. Yeah. Oh no, it's just that. I mean, I cannot not see the amazing momentum that has started since four or five years when it comes to IT sustainability. Like people within the tech industry and beyond really starting to question the impact, the environmental impact, but also the social, societal impact, um, the, the, the use that we have for, um, for the, the, the stuff we build, et cetera, et cetera. So this is very positive. I can see the number of people, you know, getting trained, um, demanding sometimes in their own companies, uh, numbers, um, change of practices, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very powerful wave. Now, as I said, 
Green IO is an international podcast. I've got listeners across 40 or 50 countries, and I really intend to have a more and more diversified audience. And when I travel to Malaysia, uh, to uh, some place of Africa, because obviously I'm based in Africa, I'm based in Reino Island, uh, when I start discussing with uh, Green IT peers uh, in South America, uh, well, the wave is there, but the size of the wave is 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 much smaller because for 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 different reasons, a question of timing, but also a question of hey, uh, excuse me, but uh, we are still you know a growing country, uh, mm. call it the way you want, but we are still mm -hmm. a developing country. Yep. Yep. Um, um, let us enjoy a bit uh, what we have to uh, uh, what we have to build before uh, telling us that we should degrowth or whatever. Um, and so that that's one of the explanation, but there are many many others. Once again, it's not a, it's not simple. It's complex. So that's that is, is I'm like, if they are as slow as we've been, uh, we kind of screwed. Now, if they learn of our own mistakes, uh, that that will be great. So that's kind of where where I've got this balanced approach. Then the second one is really it's it's the systemic approach of things and it's not a question of capitalism or whatever it's just a question it, of how humankind wants to survive on planet earth and put it the way you want but communism would have done worse and so, so it's not only a question of economic <laughs> system it's just the, the actual system the way we build things and the narrative that what you own is what defined yourself mm. that uh, the only mean universal mean of value is money which is incredibly stupid if you think about it like if you make one thousand dollar just by selling absolutely useless stuff and one thousand dollars by just you know inventing a new medicine or whatever i mean it's pretty obvious to everyone that there's as dollars they shouldn't wait the same but this is how we we create the narrative and so today in the tech industry there is a very, very, very small number of people who are just questioning it. And, you know, starting to ask the question is the only way to try to find an answer, which will not be one of the old recipes from the past, which will be how can we make sure that we assess the value of things and, and the usefulness of technology? And it cannot be, hey, I've raised half a billion in or, or my latest APO was successful. So I'm a successful person because I'm so I'm going to say it again. I hate them. So and, and at some point, I think they, they will sue me. But she in is not a sustainable business and should not be allowed to be to exist. I'm sorry, this business has nothing. I mean, we don't need to get a new dress every every hour and yeah. we don't need to and we cannot afford to have a new dress at, at such an environmental and societal cost and at some point some businesses shouldn't be allowed to exist and and this is a very small proportion of the the, the business existing because like a huge majority that just need to shift their business model which is pretty hard but sorry it was a very long answer to a very um simple question and the question for me is am i confident our system will evolve without breaking because we don't want a breaking system i don't want to live in a, a broken society um, um i'm afraid today um the, the trend is not positive however i'm also convinced that the momentum i talked before might be an opportunity because once you enter the path of sustainability there is no turning back the only turning back is kind of psychological safety mechanism like you become paranoid or mm. you just say okay it's too much for me to handle i don't want to talk about this i don't want to think about it at all but if you've got kids it, it's not really you cannot really stay with this position so you know you enter because you want to increase efficiency uh in your computing uh, operation of a new cloud operation and then suddenly you realize that there is embedded carbon and then you realize that there is a world beyond carbon like what about water consumption what about abiotic resource depletion and yeah. and, and then yeah. you start to say oh my, my god but actually there is also a biodiversity crisis and, and and suddenly you're like but what is this story about planetary boundaries uh oh my god and, and then oh but it's systemic and and the trend and suddenly you boom you're like and you're not becoming i mean and you're like the way we are building things and the way tech is accelerating things is not going to the right direction. But, and this is really my mojo, 
we have to take people from where they are. I mean, yeah. I will never, yeah. never, ever judge anyone starting his or her journey by, I want to make things more efficient. That's a great way to start. Mm -hmm. It's just the beginning of the journey, not the end. And th this yeah. will be a false premise to say, hey, you know, optimize things and you will have, you will be on top of Mount Everest. No, no, you will just be at the first hundred meters yeah. above sea level. But that's a great way to start a journey. So don't feel under any kind of pressure. Just follow your journey, but follow it fast because we are running out of time. Amazing. Um and if people want to hear more from you and the about the podcast, where can they where can they find it? And tell us about the conference too. Oh, um, but I put everything under uh, an umbrella website now, like a like like greenio.tech. So it's really like greenio.tech. So it's pretty easy to remember. And you you can have access to all podcast episodes with the transcript because I really want in I want wanted them for accessibility reason. Also, there is a lot of uh, non native English speaker listening to it. So. Um, you have not wrap up articles also. So every episode now seems, I've, I think, twenty episodes now. You've got a wrap up article because a lot of people that are not that much into podcast and hey, they might want to know what we've been talking about. Uh, there is a newsletter now since this week. I've done it six months late. <laughs> That was not a giant project, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a monthly newsletter. So that's really something that you you know you have and say, okay, I'm gonna have like. I don't know, two dozens, if not more, of different links to conferences, uh, studies, readings, videos, etc. Plus uh, some 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 stuff about Green Eye activity. So it's really something that I wanted people to take a step back and say, okay, what did I miss in the Green IT field uh, this month? And the big thing now is the conferences. Yes, so you mentioned it. Um, September 19th, it will be London. And I'm Yay. pretty sure that uh, we will have the opportunity to meet face-to-face -face yep. there. That'd be great. And Paris maybe melbourne i'm not 100 percent sure that if we will do melbourne in october and paris in december because the idea of these conferences were really to target i would say two populations the first one is i'm a developer i'm a cloud ops i'm a designer uh i have no clue about green it i've just i'm just climate aware enough you know and i want hands-on feedback from practitioner you know just just give me examples give me mm -hmm. something tangible mm -hmm. something something that i can work on so we've got these talks like very practical and there is there are also other populations that i wanted to target uh which are people more like you who are already quite aware and quite trained in in green it and in tech sustainability and they want to access you know latest news from uh, thought leaders etc cetera, etc cetera. but so this is really why I created this conference. But the main the main stuff that I realized is that you've got hundreds of conferences worldwide about green tech. And they will all be about the narrative, as we discussed, how tech will save the world. And once again, don't get me wrong, it might be right, it might be wrong, it depends. But where do people having a knack for green IT, for tech sustainability, for even digital sustainability at large, could meet, could network, could um, you know find business opportunities, uh, find possibilities for open source projects, etc. Mm -hmm. The truth is almost nowhere. You have a conference in Paris called Green Tech Forum, who has started two years ago. You've got you had a conference in Germany, just one in Berlin, yep. with the SDIA and, and Green Coding Berlin. Fortunately, there is another one uh, this year in Munich. But but the truth is, where do we meet? And that's mm. very important to me. And the Green IO, it, it's a brand. It's as it is. It's not like the most powerful brand on earth. Huh? But but you know, it gets some traction. And I wanted to create this opportunity with partnering with API Days for like-minded people to me and say, you know, and I think now in London 2024, it will be a bit different, like the very first one that we did in London. And and a lot of people in the IT green IT field, they're like, will you be there yeah i will be there because you know this is the place where i can meet other like-minded people mm -hmm. get the latest news etc and and i'm not going to travel the world at 24 7 you know covering hundreds of cities of course the idea is to empower local communities so i've got local partners usually i'm there to launch a conference but i I'm not sure if I will be in Singapore in 2027 because there are great people. The Green Eye Conference can live without me. It's not an yeah. equal game, yeah. it's a collective game. 
Brilliant. Well, look, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for coming on. And uh, as, as I think I've said to you before, it's one of my fa favourite podcasts. So uh, keep keep up thanks the great lot, work. Man. You have some great guests <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll put some links in the show notes to, to, to the ones we've mentioned. But uh, yeah, do, do go and check that out. And so, yeah, with, with that, um, come to come to an end another great episode. Um, please do uh, please do subscribe if you if you haven't already uh, and tell a friend about the podcast if you found it useful. Uh, and with that, we'll see you on the next one. Bye, Oliver. Thanks for the invitation. Mm -hmm.